we've got some interesting reports coming out of the news cycle these days. The western half of the United States is on fire, and it's somehow because Donald Trump is not talking about those fires. After weeks of rolling blackouts in his state, Gavin Newsom announced this week that he has issued an executive order requiring that all new vehicles sold in California be zero emissions vehicles by 2035. And after months of rioting, an election simulation which predicted violence unless Joe Biden is elected by a landslide and prominent Democrats urging Biden not to concede the election, the media is reporting that Donald Trump's refusal to commit to a peaceful transition is a threat to democracy. I'm beginning to wonder if satirical websites like the Babylon Bee and The Onion are actually running the media from a secret cabal. My longtime viewers know that media bias and ethical reporting in journalism is a sore point for me. I've done more than one video on the subject, and I rarely have much of anything complimentary to say to reporters. There's supposed to be a difference between news and commentary, after all. This channel is commentary, by the way, and I've never pretended otherwise. Just look at the name, folks. The content of this channel is opinion. Informed opinion, based on research and leavened with facts and statistics, but still opinion. If I ever claim that Roasted Opinions is a news source, then I expect for all of you to rip me a new one in the comments section. The last thing that any news organization needs is for anyone to start mailing it in instead of doing their job. Yet, as I search the media for news, all I see is people mailing it in. Currently, there are over 1,600 active wildfires in the United States, most of which are burning in the western half of the country. Take a look at this map copied from fireweatheravalanche.org. See the green areas? Those are forests, most of which are federal and state managed. Notice how many fires are burning on that government managed land? What does that suggest to you? To me, a commentator, that suggests that there is plenty of fuel available to feed those fires. It also suggests that the weather is keeping those areas dry. So let's look at another map. This one comes from droughtmonitor.unl.edu. Notice that the drought areas coincide with the fires as well. We have fuel and we have favorable conditions. But look at this map from NOAA. The area of fire weather is confined to the orange and red highlighted areas. Fire weather is a mixture of high heat, low humidity, and strong winds. The bulk of the fires are not in this area, though. The climate outlooks indicate that normal weather is expected for the next three months in most of the affected areas, too. So what do all these facts suggest when they are put together? They suggest that either the number and intensity of fires in the western half of the continental United States is to be expected, or they suggest that something unusual is going on. So I did more research. This journal article, published in 2016 and cited over 100 times by scholars, states that forest management policy in the western United States focuses on short-term outcomes instead of long-term goals. It says that the U.S. Forest Service is spending more time trying to protect wildlife habitat and human development from the effects of wildfires than actually managing the forest properly to create resiliency against fires, which any forestry expert worth their salt can confirm are a natural part of the life cycle of a forest. Last year, Trump earned scathing criticism for repeating the facts found within this well-cited article and threatening to pull federal funding from California for their failure to manage their forests properly. Governor Newsom told President Trump off, claiming that the fires were because of climate change. This is a climate damn emergency. This is real. And it's happening. This is the perfect storm. It is happening in unprecedented ways, year in, year out. Governor Newsom is doing a pretty good job of ignoring objective facts in favor of his agenda, though. Take, for example, his approach to emissions control. Governor Newsom issued an executive order this week requiring that all new vehicles sold in California must be zero emissions vehicles by 2035. Currently, the only zero emissions vehicles out there are either pedal powered or electric, and I doubt that this order is requiring that California stop selling cars in favor of bicycles. California has issues with air quality. It might have something to do with having nearly 40 million people living in a state which by itself would be one of the five largest economies in the world, and which produces about a quarter of a trillion dollars in manufacturing output every year. It might also have something to do with hundreds of wildfires burning simultaneously. But I digress. 
Governor Newsom wants to clean up California's air quality issues and slow down global climate change in the process by eliminating all net carbon emissions. To that end, he issued this most recent order, but Gavin Newsom has other policies with which he hopes to combat carbon emissions. Fossil fuels are the principal source of electrical production, so Governor Newsom is making California go green with solar plants, hydroelectric generation, and wind farms. So far, he switched more than 22 gigawatts of generating capacity to these sources. At the same time, to continue California's march towards safe energy, only one nuclear generator, the Diablo Canyon Power Plant, is operating, and they are scheduled to shut down permanently by 2025. The fact that nuclear power generation has zero carbon emissions is being politely ignored, as is the fact that about 8.6% of California's annual power generation comes from just this one power plant. These policy changes have resulted in a decline in annual power generation in California of about 20 terawatt hours since 2006, a total loss of about 10%. California currently consumes roughly 60 terawatt hours more than it produces each year, causing the price of electricity in California to rise over five times as fast as the rest of the nation. Remember that drought map? California is experiencing drought, and yet is counting on hydroelectric power generation. A lack of rain is good for solar generation, of course, but to break that drought will take a lot of rain, and what's good for hydro will be bad for solar. Governor Newsom's policies are reducing generation capacity at the same time that demand for electricity is going up, causing planned blackouts to be necessary. And yet his proposal? Switch to electric cars. California currently adds about 2 million new vehicles each year. Even at a steady state, 2 million new electrical vehicles would create a major impact. The average electrical vehicle requires 2,268 kilowatt hours per year times 2 million, and that's an additional 4.536 terawatt hours of annual demand on a power grid, which is generating less, importing more, and implementing planned blackouts. If Governor Newsom is successful, all 15.1 million automobiles in California will become electrical, requiring over 34 terawatt hours of electricity annually to power them. I think that Governor Newsom is trying to increase available power, just not available electrical power, But then again, that's in keeping with what we're seeing in the 2020 election cycle from his party. After much ado for more than a year, former VP Joe Biden is the Democratic nominee. Rather like California, Joe's brain keeps experiencing rolling blackouts. He has so far run a successful campaign by hiding in his basement while the media and the congressional Democrats go after his opponent at full throttle. That works well for many reasons. If it's too late in the day, then Joe's clarity falls off too far to be intelligible, and Joe can't get caught being touchy-feely with anyone but his wife if he stays off the campaign trail. Sleepy, creepy, senile Uncle Joe defies all logical expectations for a presidential candidate, and I'm firmly convinced that he was nominated for two reasons. First, if Joe wins, then he probably won't finish his term. That means that his vice president would take over, and that would mean President Kamala Harris. Now, Senator Harris's presidential campaign didn't survive to the primary elections, but that doesn't matter much. She seems to be everything that the Washington Democrats want in the White House right now. A Californian who sits about as far to the left as Governor Newsom. She would be a worthy successor to such other California power politicians as Nancy Pelosi, doing a great job of telling the rest of the country that they need to be more like California. In the Oval Office... Kamala Harris might just attempt to do what Gavin Newsom is doing, ordering the rest of the country to convert to renewable power only and stop selling anything but electrical vehicles, among other things. Second, if Joe loses, then the Democratic Party hasn't ruined the chances of a young up-and-coming politician. Joe Biden is 77 years old. He's the fifth oldest person in history to run for president, just ahead of Donald Trump and actually behind both Mike Bloomberg and Bernie Sanders, two of his opponents in the Democratic primaries this year. A loss could easily be blamed on Joe Biden's lack of appeal with young voters. Of course, both of these choices are off of the table if it's a close election. In anything but a Biden landslide, the current Democratic National Committee plan seems to be to fight. Hillary Clinton has urged Biden not to concede the election despite the fact that the loser of the election doesn't have to concede the election for the winner to be inaugurated. 
The Biden campaign has about a thousand lawyers on retainer, ready to contest any close results in the courts and demand that every vote be counted. The Congressional Democrats used a hearing into the recent changes made by the Postmaster General to imply that Donald Trump was weaponizing the USPS against the use of mail-in ballots. And yet we are already seeing reports of small numbers of ballots, many of them in favor of Donald Trump, being discarded before they get to election officials. Simulations conducted by the Transition Integrity Project showed that every scenario besides a clear Biden win resulted in unrest and a contested transition. The fact that three of the four scenarios assumed that Biden won the popular vote and that in the fourth scenario there was clear election fraud right down to destroyed ballots wasn't reported in the press, though. The White House press corps, ever eager to go after President Trump and his press secretary, has repeatedly asked the president to commit to a peaceful transition of power by honoring the results of the election. Now, if he commits to this, then the Democratic leadership and the media will go after him the second that he says, wait a minute, no matter what happens during the election. So he refuses to say yes to them, despite the fact that his statement would only be binding in the court of public opinion, and they immediately start blitzing coverage of how he plans to stage a military coup. This isn't a new tactic, mind you. In 2019, a contested election simulation indicated that Trump would summon the military to keep himself in office. In 2016, reporters were asking Trump to commit to respecting the results of the election as well, even before he had any access to military or law enforcement assets beyond his Secret Service detail, and despite the fact that Hillary Clinton was the projected winner of the election before a single ballot was cast. The narrative is that unrest will follow any result but an overwhelming Biden victory, and even then, Trump will have to be escorted from the building like a spoiled child. Now, the threat of unrest and even violence doesn't match up to what we've seen from the GOP in the last four years. It doesn't match up to what we've come to expect from the GOP for over a hundred years, to be blunt about it. The last time that the GOP threatened physical harm towards U.S. citizens was back in the mid-19th century when Southern Democrats decided that they would rather secede than accept a GOP president. It's not GOP supporters gathering in the middle of cities to declare autonomous zones and launch loud protests that are quickly devolving into riots. The GOP isn't known for having massive activist movements. That's part of the reason why the Tea Party was such a controversial group, and the Tea Party doesn't have a record of looting, burning, and vandalizing large portions of cities. No, forcing political change through unrest is typically a tactic of far-left activist movements. Refusing to accept the results of the election is what Al Gore did in 2000, when he repeatedly sued for more recounts rather than accept the fact that he lost Florida by a few hundred votes. Refusing to concede graciously is what Hillary Clinton did when she didn't even contemplate losing, didn't have a speech prepared in case she lost, and even advocated for electors to cast ballots faithlessly for her since she had won the national popular vote. Yet the Congressional Democrats and the media are sticking to the narrative that Trump is the one most likely to reject the results of the election. Never waste a crisis, huh? Never mind that it's a manufactured crisis designed to cast doubt on the legitimacy of the election and scare people into voting for the crypt keeper that the DNC nominated. Never mind that the president and most of the GOP are raising concerns about the security of the election and the voting process after a major change to voting procedures. The blame has to be placed on Trump for what people who would never vote for Trump might do, because once again, the orange man is bad. They really think that all of us are that stupid. They really expect us to just line up like good little voters and hate President Trump, especially if we aren't members of the 1%. Funny thing, though, the 1% is overwhelmingly filled with people who think that the rest of us should hate Donald Trump. Weird, huh?